Okay. Um, one of my colleagues challenged me this morning already that uh, it's my task to wake you all up. <laughs> um, so let's see what I can do. Um, before we start with the actual presentation, I thought because uh, this day in particular is dedicated to the memory of Mila, I'll say a few words about Mila. I'm not the right person to really give a biography of her, but I'll just give you one episode uh, of encounter that I had with Mila that is also connected to the topic of this presentation. So I, I actually met Mila not that long ago. I mean, really meeting her uh, personally and discussing with her. Of course, I knew of her and her work uh, for a long time. But uh, when I really started talking to her uh, about math was uh, at a workshop in Sanya in 2015. I don't know how many of you know this place. It's uh, kind of like this place here, uh, but uh, in China. <laughs> Uh, and you see this really imp very imposing uh, flight of stairs that leads up to this institute, so it's quite impressive. Anyway, so this is uh, when I met her, and when we started uh, talking was after I gave this uh, presentation about uh, discrete gradient approaches or the idea of using discrete gradients for discretizing and optimizing um, total variation type problems. And, uh, okay, I gave this presentation, so this was uh, now kind of uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, after that, Mila came to me and uh, she said, well, so it's all, you know, really interesting, but I think you have to understand much more uh, about this. And uh, we really took this to heart, and so we worked a lot, as you can see here, uh, on understanding this. We, I think we still don't completely understand it, but uh, a few things we, we actually discovered. And um, I have to say the main person behind this uh, who really uh, uh, took off like a rocket on this discrete gradient method is Erland, Erland Rees, who is a PhD student in Cambridge and who is also here. And you know, uh, will know in a second why I'm talking about him because uh, this is, uh, is now connected to another uh, um, character feature of Mila that she was also always very supportive of early career researchers. And so also in her honor, I thought it might be, might be a bit of an unconventional, but maybe good idea if not I present this, but actually the brain behind everything uh, that Erlen presents this uh, talk. And so he will take over in a second. Um, this is just uh, one of the last pictures that uh, we took with Mila uh, in Cambridge when she was with us for kind of a similar program as we have here now at the ESP uh, in autumn uh, 2017. So in July she was just there to uh, check out the place basically. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I think we all miss her a lot and uh, this, uh, what I just said is maybe just one, one of the reasons why we miss her. Um, okay, so I let Erland take over. Erland, are you ready? Okay. Um, so I'll start just by... Better now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll start, start by talking about um, numerical integration and geometric integration in general and the motivations for um, studying optimization theory uh, with these tools. Then I'll move on to talking about uh, the, discrete, the discrete gradient method we're considering for non-smooth non-complex optimization. And then at the end I'll talk a little bit about future steps sort of moving beyond uh, what we looked at first. Um, right. So, just to put the project in context, I thought I'd talk about uh, yeah, numerical integration and connections to optimization. So, obviously, a basic or fundamental notion of optimization, or when you want to s solve a simple minimization problem for a real valued function v, um, is gradient flow. So, moving in the negative direction of the gradient of a function. And the two sort of main building blocks of optimization algorithms 
would be gradient descent and proximal methods, uh, which can be viewed as forward Euler and backward Euler discretization of gradient flow. Um, so it sort of makes sense that uh, the study of uh, flows and ordinary differential equations and the study of discret discretization methods um, can enhance our understanding of optimization theory. Um, some examples of this in literature um, is when you have an optimization algorithm and you want to understand it better by passing to the continuous limit, derive an ODE, and then analyze this ODE and infer properties back to the algorithm. So an example of this is uh, people who have looked at Nesterov acceleration methods. Uh, so this work by Stu, Boyd, and Kandes, they um, um, associated the algorithm with a second order ODE and were able to look at properties like oscillation in terms of the system. Um, another way that numerical integration is useful for optimization is by developing algorithms to overcome certain obstacles in um, an optimization problem. So this recent work, um, they basically applied stabilized explicit Runge-Kutta methods, um, originally designed for stiff ODEs, in order to increase the permissible time steps. Uh, for example, if your optimization problem has severely restrictive time steps. Um, and a third example is when you identify some flow or ODE and there are certain structures or symmetries that you need to preserve in your discretization method in order to um, retain some desired behavior. So one recent example of this is people again looking at Nesterov acceleration phenomenon and identifying some uh, flows and curves with certain structures and identifying what types of discretization methods preserve this and which do not. Um, right, and then we have geometric numerical integration. So this is based on the idea that a lot of ODEs have certain structures, some geometric features. Um, and that if you preserve these features, then you'll have a numerical scheme that's more stable or preserves some desirable properties. Uh, so examples of such structures would be a conservation law or an energy dissipation law, symplectic structure, um, to mention some. Uh, yeah, and an aim in geometric, geometric numerical integration is to develop discretization methods to preserve such features. Um, so this is where discrete gradient methods come in. Uh, so these are a class of methods that are designed <coughs> to preserve various things. So they preserve uh, first integrals, energy conservation, and dissipation loss. Uh, they also preserve the Lyapunov functions for systems. Um, and yes, this figure is taken from um, a paper where they looked at um, modeling just the two-body problem, uh, the Kepler two-body problem. Um, where this is the movement of one body with the other body placed in the middle. Um, and the system basically has four energy conservation laws. It has a Hamiltonian structure and uh, angular momentum preservation. So by formulating some discrete gradient projection methods, they're able to achieve better and better and more stable results by increasingly preserving more of these energies using discrete gradient methods. Um, there's also a recent survey, Why Geometric Numerical Integration, by Ari Serlis and Reinhard Kispel, if you're interested. Um, but for optimization, um, the basic idea and motivation for this project is to minimize V. We want to discretize gradient flow using um, discrete gradient methods to pres preserve the dissipative structure of discrete gradients. Um, to preserve the dissipative structure of gradient flow. Um, so a discrete gradient method is any mapping, or rather a discrete gradient is any mapping um, that takes two vectors as input and it has to satisfy two properties. Um, as y goes to x, it needs to approximate the gradient of the function in the limit. And 
it needs to satisfy a mean value property, meaning that the, if you apply the inner product between two points, then that should equal the difference in function valuations. Um, and simply from this mean value property, we can um, derive quite simply a dissipative structure of the discrete gradient method. So this is how you would discretize gradient flow with discrete gradients. And the dissipative structure can be seen accordingly. So you first use uh, the mean value property to set up the difference in function evaluations by this. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then basically you see that it dissipates uh, as much as the squared norm of the discrete gradient or in the step size you take, which is uh, the same structure as, as gradient flow. And this also holds for all time steps. So it has some sense of unconditional stability, which is another initial motivation for this product, for, the, for this uh, project. Um, so, the first paper that came out from this work, um, which was collaboration with Carola Schoenlib and Reinhard Kispel and some other people, um, they applied these algorithms to variational optimization problems for image reg regularization. Um, and one of the main results they provided was that provided standard assumptions on the function V, such as C1 smoothness. Um, they show that the gradient vanishes along the iterates. Um, so does the um, distance between each iterate. And every accumulation point of the sequence of iterates will be a stationary point. And um, yeah, they applied this to various um, imaging problems, such as in-painting. Um, and just to give some examples of discrete gradients, because uh, there are infinitely many, and they can approximate the gradient to arbitrarily high orders. But in practice, the three discrete gradients that people use are the Gonzalez or midpoint discrete gradient, which was the first um, discrete gradient sort of introduced by Oscar Gonzalez. Um, another one is the mean value discrete gradient. Um, this is also more interesting in geometric integration because it's what's known as a B-series and also because it sort of has this linearity with the gradient in that the gradient and the integral commutes. It has quite nice uh, structural properties. Um, and then the third one is the Itoaba or coordinate increment discrete gradient. Um, so this is a derivative-free discrete gradient and is evaluated by computing successive uh, finite difference quotients. Um, and yeah, so it's the eta of discrete gradient that we became interested in for non-smooth optimization because we can sort of combine a notion of gradient flow dissipation but in a derivative resetting. Um, just to mention where Itob appears otherwise in optimization theory. Um, so there's a previous paper with Corolla and Torben Ringholm and Jasmine Olasic um, looking at image in painting with Euler's Alaska regularization. So this is a non comics problem, and one of the motivations for using Itob discrete gradient is that the gradient is quite expensive to compute. So to alternatively just solve um, derivative free um, steps. Uh, was of interest and it, they could also parallelize the algorithm and got quite uh, nice and competitive results with state-of-art methods. Um, if you apply the e to discrete gradient method to a linear system, then you actually end up with successive over-relaxation and the Gauss-Seidel method. Um, and therefore also by extension, you can derive the Kutch-March method um, from this. Um, right, so now we'll focus more just on the ETO e discrete gradient and set it up for a non smooth, non comic setting. Uh, so we can write this method in a more compact form um, as solving the following uh, nonlinear equation, and then you update DK 
um, along each coordinate as you go. Um, and it has the same sort of dissipative structure, just that it's derivative free. Um, you can show that it's well defined, so an update exists for any continuous function. Um, and the nonlinear equation is not difficult to solve. Um, you can, for example, allow the time step to exist within a, lar within a large interval of time steps. And then a well tuned algorithm can solve it in only a few function evaluations. Um, and yeah, and so basically you can consider these methods that descend along directions dk. And you can keep the standard ETOB method where you just let dk cycle through the standard coordinates. Or you can consider other methods such as randomizing, uh, drawing random directions from the, unit, from the um, standard coordinates or even from just the unit sphere. And yeah, some, motiv some practical motivations for studying um, the ETOB method in this context is um, to solve optimization problems where your objective function will be non-smooth, non-convex, and black box, meaning that you can only compute function evaluations, not gradients. Um, so one example is the bi-level optimization of variational regularization problems. So where you're optimizing the parameters that go into a variational imaging problem, for example, um, often with non-smooth lower level terms. Um, so this is generally known that this will be a non-smooth, non-convex function. And in general, it can be quite hard, or at least computationally expensive and, and impractical to compute gradients. Um, and more generally, we're interested in optimizing parameters that go into some sort of model simulation. <coughs> so a different project that we'd like to work on is um, to apply this to um, models of optimizing camera positions for full coverage in a room, which has different sort of applications in robotics. Um, and yeah, other contexts where this analysis is interesting is when the gradients are computationally expensive, or for example, when the problem is poorly conditioned or stiff, so that you can, so it's good to have the stability with respect to uh, time steps and large time steps. Okay, so now I'll talk about um, the non-smooth, non-convex convergence analysis that we did. Um, so we first wanted a notion of what would we like to sort of achieve or prove. Um, so we want the notion of stationarity and first order optimality for non-smooth, non-convex functions. And then you have the Clark subdifferential, um, which was introduced by Clark in 1973. Um, this is a notion of subdifferential that in one sense can be seen as the convex hull of all limiting um, gradients of the function around that area. Um, it generalizes the gradient as well as the classical subdifferential for convex function so that if, you're, if you have a convex function it coincides with the classical subdifferential and if a function is strictly differentiable it, it's, uh, it coincides with the derivative at that point. Um, it's quite widely used in non-smooth, non-convex optimization theory because it has several nice properties, uh, provided that the function is locally Lipschitz continuous. So this includes its outer semi-continuous, it has a nice mean value theorem, um, and subdifferential will be non-empty and convex and compact. Um, and then we say that X is a Clark stationary point whenever zero belongs to the subdifferential. Um, and another sort of concept that's cl quite closely tied in with first order optimality for in this framework is the Clark directional derivative or what he called the generalized directional derivative which is sort of the same as the directional derivative but you take a supremum around the neighborhood of your point. Um, and then another way of saying that point is Clark stationary is that it's um, directionally stationary for all directions d on the unit interval or on the unit sphere. Um, so we'd like to prove that 
um, all accumulation points of the E2OB discrete gradient method will be Clark stationary. Um, and just to talk about sort of the main ideas or arguments that go into uh, the proof of our result. Um, the first thing is that the local Lipschitz cont continuity of the function v implies that the Clark directional derivative is upper semi-continuous, uh, meaning that we are able to pass from a, com a convergent subsequence to say something about the stationarity at the limit point. So this is closely also tied in with the outer semi-continuity of the subdifferential. Um, we still inherit from the continuously differentiable case for discrete gradient methods that the updates will, the difference in the updates will vanish and that this sort of derivative free directional or discrete gradient will vanish as well. Um, so then we can say that provided that we have a subsequence of the iterates and the directions that converge to a limit point and a limiting direction, um, then by the upper semi-continuity of um, the directional derivative and using this we can derive that the limb inf of the sequence will be at least zero and therefore by upper semi-continuity we have directional stationarity at limit points. So then all we need is to combine this with ensuring that um, the subsequence of directions dkj will be dense uh, and then you'll have stationarity. Um, so we consider two approaches for or two settings for this. So the first one is um, randomly drawn directions. So then it's sufficient to assume that the support of your probability distribution has full support on the unit sphere. Um, you can also consider deterministic directions and then you need to assume that not only is the entire sequence dense, but it's what we've called cyclically dense, uh, which means that we're able to construct subsequences that also preserve the, the density. Um, so, yeah, so that leads to the main um, convergence theorem of this paper. Um, so if the function is local Lipschitz continuous, um, then, and we make appropriate assumptions on the directions, as I just discussed, then we can show that the iterates will converge to a non-empty connecting and compact set of accumulation points. All the accumulation points will be Clark stationary, and also all accumulation points will have the same function value on V. Um, so, yeah, so the only thing that you need to change with the E2OB discrete gradient method to have convergence guarantees for non smooth non complex functions <laughs> is that you no longer just go along standard coordinates, but you um, move along sort of dens densely on the unit sphere. Um, and another nice thing about this study is that we can also, if you assume that the underlying function is actually, actually C1 smooth, then you can sort of still infer properties inherited from gradient flow. Um, so you get standard convergence rates um, of the function that it vanishes as 1 over k if v is convex, it vanishes linearly if v is a polyak yavashevitz function or if it's strongly convex. Um, and the convergence rate is also marginally better than the convergence rate of coordinate descent. Um, you can also do a kurdika jovashevitz inequality analysis to show that for such functions um, the iterates will converge to, to a unique point. And lastly, all of these properties solve for arbitrary time steps, provided you have any bounds C and big C. Um, yeah, I haven't included many numerical examples in this talk. Um, here's just one where we tested it on um, the Rosenbrock function, uh, which is sort of a classic test case for non-smooth, well, for non-convex optimization. We also applied it to a non-smooth variant of the Rosenbrock function. Um, and it, um, yeah, it solves it quite nicely. Um, one thing I just thought I'd point out is that 
so this is the convergence rates for different types of ETOB methods. So uh, the blue curve is the convergence rate where you use the standard coordinates, so the standard ETOB discrete gradient method. And the two other plots are two variants of randomly drawing directions. Uh, so this is just to illustrate that when the function is generally ill-conditioned or difficult to deal with or quite non-smooth, it can be beneficial to not just consider the directional, um, the standard coordinates, but to move in random directions. Um, right, so just to finish the talk, um, I'll briefly just discuss some extensions, so moving beyond just the standard gradient flow. Um, one thing that um, uh, Martin Benning suggested looking at was um, inverse scale space flow. So now you're sort of moving in the direction of uh, the Bregman distance of a certain function j. Um, so yeah, so j, you want it to be a convex function. It could be the L1 norm or the elastic net, so a combination of the L2 and the L1 norm. Um, the Bregman distance, which is a notion of distance induced by the function j, uh, is defined accordingly and satisfies some of the properties, such as non-negativity uh, of a distance measure. And the motivation for considering the inverse scale space flow is partly to solve problems such as solving an inverse problem where you want to choose the optimal solution given a function j you want to also minimize. Uh, for example, if you're looking for um, a sparse solution, um, or also uh, a, be a more well-behaved algorithm for um, solving a regularized problem. Um, so this leads to the inverse scale space flow um, where you move in the negative direction of, the, of a subgradient of the function j. Um, and you recover gradient flow if you replace j with just a standard L um, squared norm divided by 2. Um, so this already has well-known methods such as um, the Bregman iteration method. Uh, you have the linearized Bregman iteration method, so this can be seen as the sort of backward and Euler and forward Euler methods. Um, and then we can also apply a discrete gradient method to this um, in the sort of same straightforward analogy. And the uh, and it basically has a nice dissipative structure in that now um, at each update you descend by the squared norm of um, the, um, um, the symmetrized Bregman distance between those two points. And if we apply this to the Itoab method, then we can again show that it's a well-defined method. Um, <coughs> if it's convex, then the updates will be unique. Um, and we can apply a similar analysis to show that um, the iterates will converge to clock stationary points of the function v. Um, so you can also consider this in the same non-smooth, non-comics uh, setting. Um, and it's, it can be useful if you know certain structures of your objective function that you want to incorporate, such as sparsity. Uh, or if it has certain structured non-smoothness, then including an L1 term in the Bregman function will help it handle the non-smoothness better. Um, so just to illustrate the speed-up benefits, so if we consider a standard linear system where your ground truth has around 10% sparsity, and this blue curve is then the convergence rate for the standard SOR or gauss seidel method, or in this case also the e to discrete gradient method. Um, if, you, if you include then an L1 term in your Bregman divergence function, um, then the iterates of the e to method will be more sensitive to, I guess, the sparsity of the ground truth and it converges at a much higher rate and it also identifies the correct um, uh, support set. Um, and you can also do it to handle regularized linear systems 
um, to deal with non smoothness. And again, um, the improvement in rates you get from including this Bregman flow um, makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, and then just outlook in terms of future work. Um, one thing that we'd like to do is just to formulate an acceleration, sort of Nestor type acceleration for the ETOB method. Um, and we also would like to look at the discrete gradient method in other uh, settings. So, for example, other types of gradient flow under different metrics, for example, with applications to optimal transport. Um, thanks a lot for your attention, and here are some of the relevant papers. So, are there some questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it's new or not. It looks new uh, uh, as far as I know. But it, it, it also reminds me strongly of a method uh, called the gradient sampling method, I think, which was published by Adri Adrian Lewis some time ago. Maybe Jalal knows about this better than me. But it's also basically you, you, you sample a, a function in the neighborhood of the point where you want to evaluate the gradient and you, and you descend. And do you, do you know this work and do you know how it compares? I came across it while doing literature review for this work. Um, so I, I didn't look at it too closely because I guess there they do have access to the gradients, at least in the neighborhood of the points. Um, so whereas we just consider the setting where you only have function evaluations. Um, I'm not sure about that. Maybe you're right. Oh, OK. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if you do have, or if you're able to sample gradients in you know, an area, then I expect that would definitely oh, yes. be beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether the fact that you don't have access to the gradient, is there some kind of curse of dimensionality so that the, the convergence will slow with the dimension or something? Yeah. Like the, the, the rate. And is it like uh, something it's, uh, you cannot defeat, like it's, because you don't have access to the gradient, you will always have to be slower? Uh. Um, yeah, so it does worsen with, um, um, the dimensions, so it's not something, if you have a bi-level optimization problem with sort of a quite huge, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of parameters, um, this would probably not be feasible. Um, it scales similar to this coordinate descent method in terms of the efficiency. So in one sense, if you choose random directions, um, then um, it does sort of yeah, uh, you'll achieve sort of a stable rate of descent. You just have to solve further nonlinear equations at each iterate, kind of. But yeah, it does worsen with the rate, depending on the dimension, how you'd expect it to. Another question? Yes. <laughs> Oh, hi. This is a very uh, interesting talk. Um, I'm just uh, wondering about the practical efficiency. Gradient flow methods tend to be slow. Are these ones fast? Or? Um, the, if you compare it to gradient descent, it, it's on a similar rate. Um, sometimes it's slightly faster, but it's comparable to gradient descent and gradient flow. Yeah. So the main advantage you think are in the theoretical side, like it guarantees convergence and so on? Um, 
Yeah, well, it's, um, yeah, it has a nice, you know, it's quite amenable to non-smooth non-comics and derivative-free analysis. Mm. So I think that's one appealing feature that you can sort of retain some perspectives of gradient flow while remaining derivative-free. Um, but yeah, it's definitely comparable with many other methods in terms of the efficiency. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Okay, so thank you again. Thank you.